Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. <laughs> All right. So should we should we say something about like what this is that we're doing for people who are unfamiliar? I think so, yeah. Well, right. So uh, we we do this thing for our Patreons at C4SS, our patrons, Patreons, no one knows actually which is the proper term, uh, where we, it's usually Logan, Alex, and I, or Logan, Eric, and I, or Logan, Tony, Alex, Eric, I, who knows. It's usually like a bunch of C4SS staff sit down and we discuss just the news of the day uh, and record it as a roundtable that's released only for our uh, patrons. This one is going to get released publicly because we are, you know, actually secret capitalists trying to get you to buy our stuff. <laughs> that's a joke for the tankies on Twitter. But um, uh, just to give you a taste of the sort of things that we usually talk about um, and also to you know, help contribute to this great conference that uh, I'd once again like to thank Logan for putting together. <laughs> All right, yeah, so- Thank uh, you so much for having us. I um, I just wanna add, so we have a couple of podcasts at the Center for a Stateless Society now. This one recently got a name, uh, it's called The Out Group. Um, and then we have three other podcasts. Uh, we have Mutual Exchange Radio, which is Zach sitting down with guests to talk about Anarchist theory, anarchist or activism, you. economics, or me sometimes sitting down with uh, with guests. And then we have a show called The Enrage, which is hosted by Joel Williamson. Eric helps out with that. Um, and that is with uh, writers at the Center for a Stateless Society about recent work that they've put out. Um, and then finally, uh, Logan's podcast, The Green Market Agorist, has come in-house to see for assess recently so we're going to be helping out with that as well and we're excited to have that in our podcast lineup as well yeah i'm excited to be on it's been great to expand that project 
wee bit further. And also, just so the people watching know, uh, we will also have Joel doing an episode of his other podcast, Non-Surveyum, at 1 p.m. Central, this coup de gras, this Sunday. Um, doing an interview with Scott Crow. So definitely check that out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I suppose we should get into uh, the actual content of the show today. Um, I guess we can also introduce ourselves a little bit for people who don't know. So I am Zach. Uh, as mentioned, I host podcasts for C4SS, and I also do some uh, do some writing work, although not much, with the center. And um, my sort of day job is academia. I'm a grad student in philosophy, and I teach philosophy at Western Michigan University. Uh, do you two want to say something for you two? Sure. Yeah, cool. I'll, uh, I'll hop in next. So I'm Alex. I am the coordinating director at Center for a Stateless Society and help out with the podcast stuff as well as editing whatever else needs to be done. Um, my current day job is operating forklifts in a warehouse for a nonprofit that distributes food aid. So they're like the distribution center for uh, soup kitchens and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm done there in two weeks and I'm very excited. And I'm gonna be going back to freelance writing as my day job um, with hopes of actually joining the academy. Zach has tried to dissuade me from doing grad school, but that's not. I haven't tried to dissuade you. I've just, uh, I haven't tried to dissuade you. I just noted that uh, the world sucks right now, generally, and it sucks more if you do hard things like academia. <laughs> yeah, which is which is entirely fair. Um, and I guess I, I should add some of my biggest intellectual interests are mutual aid and alternative institutions, um, economics of mutual aid and alternative institutions. Uh, egoism, which I will also be on a panel on egoism uh, later this weekend, uh -huh. Sunday morning. What time is it, CST, Logan? Um, let me look it up again. It okay. is. Who? It is our second panel of the morning at eleven a.m., twelve p.m. See right. Central. Yeah, so I will be back to talk about egoism then, but for now, I will turn it over to Eric. Uh, I'm Eric. I don't know if anyone heard me just absolutely nail my leg on my fridge as I tried to play. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my name is Eric Fleischman. Um, I don't really have a title at Center for State Society. I just kind of am in the work, work group. I, kind of, I just help out where I can, um, especially with publishing and uh I consider I, I self describe as the logistics gremlin for the Orange. Um, I'm an undergrad student in uh, philosophy and anthropology, uh, with particular interests in uh, dialectical philosophy and feminist philosophy and uh, economic anthropology and anthropology of stateless societies. Um, was there anything else we were supposed to, we were supposed to talk about? <laughs> I guess not. Uh, that sounds good. All right, so. Let's get into, I guess, what we wanted to talk about today, um, which we sort of recorded a version of this, the four of us, a couple weeks ago, but uh, it got lost to the Discord gremlins. Um, yeah, it was sad. Um, two hours gone. Uh, hopefully that gave us some practice, though. <laughs> so um, uh, I... I guess we're only going to do two topics because we usually wind up spending way too much time on topics when we do more than that. <laughs> so one we will do is uh, the Trump impeachment um, trial and some stuff that has happened with maybe our reactions because we haven't really commented on that publicly uh, to the um, uh, January 6th coup slash whatever we're t calling it, um, terrorist attack was what the liberals want to call it. Um, but you know, we have reasons not to call it. Maybe that can be part of the discussion. Um, and then we will go into the, uh, some of the actions Biden has taken economically and maybe some demands for him to increase the minimum wage, uh, that sort of thing. 
All right. Um, so let's get going. Uh, does anyone who's been paying particular attention want to introduce uh, the Trump topic? This is the part we usually edit out, by the way, and when we can release these. Um, I, I can I can try to uh, handle that. Although right. uh, I'm 100 percent going to get something wrong, and then somebody's going to call me out for getting it wrong. Um, That's fine. Uh, so yeah, so the the Senate has voted that the impeachment is constitutional, and so we'll go forward in the voting. Um, Republicans like McConnell have expressed, um, many Republicans have expressed their hesitancy in um, impeaching, although um, the actual defense by the Trump administration has been lackluster, to say the least. I don't know if anybody has been watching it, but it's it's almost ridiculous how bad it is. Um, I'm their, not, defense, you know, their defense just started today, right? Um, gosh, uh, time, time doesn't mean anything to me at this point in my life um, does it mean anything to anyone in 2020 and 2021 honestly does anyone well, I know, know one of the things one of the things they did do today was play a video of different democratic politicians saying the word fight because they got it into their heads for some reason that the problem with what trump did and said on the sixth was that he used the word fight yeah, they outlined, they were like, there's three things that he talked about. It was fight for America, fight for, for patriotism, the the stop the steal, and gosh, what was the last one? Um, it was like three phrases that they kept showing videos of, of um, Trump saying, and then they showed videos of Democrats saying it to be like, oh, it's not actually that big of a deal. I think if, if I'm, I don't remember yeah, that, right, right. that's what you're saying. Um and then I will add that uh, it has been noted by outlets that technically Republicans can like save face by just not showing up to the actual like decision to uh, convict on the impeachment um, because you only need a two thirds majority of senators present to do so. Not a two thirds majority right. of senators. And, and I guess it's worth noting also that it, isn't it still unlikely that they're actually going to get a conviction out of this? Um, because only six Republicans voted that they thought that the impeachment was constitutional, I believe. Uh, um, I believe you're correct. And it, it's like that. It just seems unlikely that uh, they're going to get enough Republican votes on board to be able to actually, you know, vote to convict. Yeah. Also, um, I mean, McConnell has kind of turned. Uh, you know, turned around completely and gone from mm -hmm. saying that uh, this is, you know, something that could be impeachable to, I don't know what, I mean, there, it was trending on Twitter. It was like, what, what does Trump have on, uh, on McConnell? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, what it probably is, is he sat back and did his political calculus and decided that he can get more, like make the extremely short-sighted and selfish decision that you can get more mobilization of Republican voters out of, outrage uh if like the republican party is unified behind trumpy bullshit or whatever um for 2022 or maybe 2024 as well um that's probably all that happened there but if i had to guess but like he was always kind of on the fence about it wasn't he he was never like 100 percent mitch mcconnell was yeah hard to read i mean going back and forth one of one of my favorite things that's come out of this recently is for the ones who are now saying ted cruz Rand paul people who are now saying like this was a constitutional protest and like nothing happened blah 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 i saw this this really great sort of clap back Wait, at them they are saying that now the yeah the i mean Am I wrong in thinking that both of those two have been... I don't know. I haven't really been paying attention to what clowns have been saying the last like, yeah. few weeks because <laughs> yeah. because I've been like, I've been like, right. you know... They're the ones who are saying it's it's not it's not a constitutional impeachment and blah, blah, blah. And like well, Americans... well, I know they're saying... That, I know they're like making the argument that somehow you can't impeach a president after they are out of office, which, you know, there's absolutely no reason to think that from anything the founders said. And there's absolutely no reason to think that that would be a wise precedent to set for obvious reasons. Like the president can commit an impeachable offense before they're out of office and have faced essential impunity. Um, which is actually, you know, 
fascinating how dumb that argument is to me because like the founders explicitly said things like if the president wants to pardon themselves impeachment is the way to check that it's like yeah. so you right. want to neuter that mechanism completely but also yeah. to pardon yourself the president has to admit that he's done a crime right like that's the yeah. issue you can't just pardon yourself like unilaterally for right 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 that too um so what I, mean, I was trying to say, what I was trying to sorry. say is that for these Republican senators who have been defending what happened or saying that Americans, you know, who voted for Trump have something worth saying, um, there's this excellent clapback that's been going around of, okay, so why were you not out there like greeting them and talk? if they're your people who have a legitimate grievance, when they stormed the Capitol, why did you hide? Which I think is an excellent question, you know. Like if you're someone who's who's acting yeah. like it wasn't a big deal, but while it was happening, you were hiding from them. I mean, there's a level at which I think if anyone is claiming that, they're really not being sincere. They're really not taking it in good faith. I mean, there's no reason way you could possibly say that in good faith and not be like I, I don't want to say that our that our political leaders are smart or anything. But they're not that dumb, right? Right, right. They're um, <laughs> they're, they're saying yeah, they're, things they're, that they know are not. They're saying they're things capable. that they know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you should read Hannah Arendt on like how fascist disinformation works to understand why they're saying this sort of thing, right? Um. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's wild. All right. Um. So like, I I guess it's worth talking about for a minute. Um what exactly the implications are if Trump isn't convicted, which seems likely. I mean, it's certainly going to set um, a new precedent. I don't know what that precedent will be. I mean, there's only been two two impeachments before this, not including his own earlier impeachment. So of the four impeachments to ever happen in the United States, he is 50% of them. Um, will, will this... In my idealistic world where I think maybe the United States government works the way it, it advertises how it works, maybe this will be a greater check on centralized presidential power. But I also am an incredibly cynical person, so I don't know if that will actually be the case. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, and, I, and I'm also curious, not to derail it, but going forward, and this is kind of part of the, the question you just asked, Zach, is what is a particular anarchist take? on this whole operation because I know some people have been like, I'm not even going to mm -hmm. think about it. Cause that's the total, that's a statist whole thing. I'm not, that's not part of my whole sphere of thought. And some people are like, well, it's, it's important that we like, you know, um, you know, force out fascism as harshly as possible through whatever mechanisms are possible. Yeah. I think for my, from my perspective, the, the anarchist take that's like we shouldn't care about this at all, I think misunderstands some of the like short term benefit of reigning in the worst abuses of the state. Right. Um, and I see Trump getting impeached or, you know, being convicted for this current second impeachment would be a good thing from that standpoint. Um, and I my hope would be that it would maybe check some of the impulses of other folks on the GOP who want to ride that sort of fascist, white supremacist, populist wave like Trump did. Um, because my biggest worry is not Trump comes back himself, uh, but someone slightly more competent with mm. the same kind of base. Um, yeah, a smarter right. Trump. Yeah, yeah, maybe... Sorry, Logan, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, just like keeping him out of office is definitely super important. Setting a precedent that that type of thing is not allowed is super important. You know, being able to pre-establish that people like him but more competent are not allowed by that precedent is very important. And also, like, I think it goes right along with things like I mean, who the fuck was that uh, one QAnon woman who oh, is God. now Ooh. being taken off of several different committees in uh, Congress? And it's like, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's a QAnon. Yeah, Marjor are you talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene? 
Yes, yeah. her. Like, why is she even a member of Congress? First, I mean, why does Congress exist? But that's a whole nother question. <laughs> um, you know, but why is she a member if we do have it? And I think setting that precedent of like, you have to at least have a basic semblance of reality to be a fucking to be able to manipulate power over people right yeah like i think that's important so i do think that while in some senses it can be a distraction from other more important things because well the state is gonna stay but at the same time reining in the worst excesses of the state is super important, which is why I don't dismiss things like participating in the political system as, like, harm reduction or, you know, things like that. Even though I don't advocate that as the means towards change. Wait, wait, what, what like was that substantial last change. What was that Even last though... Point? I said, even though I don't advocate it, at, I, that is why I see the importance of things like voting as harm reduction okay, okay. or That's even as people participating in the political system in general as harm reduction, like running for office. But I don't see that as the as the means towards substantial change. Yeah, so, so I completely agree. I think there is a level at which uh, you have to recognize that even though there's, you know, a sense in which the belief that politicians are all, you know, smart and not sociopaths, um, that having a conspiracy theorist, borderline uh, terroristy, not in that, you, you know what I'm saying, these violent, weird people as uh, as sitting congressmen and presidents and what have you, even though it does do something to like get rid of the mirage to rational, sensible thinking people that um, the state is anything legitimate or anything more than just a gang of crazy sociopaths or whatever, you know, it does do that. The problem is that that's not the lesson most people are going to take away from it, especially the people who they're appealing to. Instead, the lesson they're going to take away from it is, uh, power is what's important and these people are the powerful ones and we need to kowtow and you know cater to them in order to make things work and you wind up with a more aggressive more authoritarian more fascistic state um yeah. and so constitutional norms and all this stuff that liberal normies like to go on about which by the way there's a good pun here involving the word normie um constitutional norms and all that stuff uh constitutional you norms know, yeah, the, that all the <laughs> constitutional normies go on and on about. Um, well, that, I mean, that's like kind of my something we that's... shouldn't care about, but it is important for the sake of right uh, reining in the worst of the impulses of these people. I mean, it's kind of Kevin Carson's whole point, um, with in large part uh, through his thought of like dialectical libertarianism of like exploring everything within its actual context, not like an idealized version of the, the world where right. yeah. obviously we, we're all anarchists, you know, as Logan said, Congress shouldn't exist, you know, government uh -huh. shouldn't exist or anything like that. But to pretend as if it doesn't exist is, you know, not a great way to deal as an anarchist because you may not consider um, the state as a, as a unit of, measurement in your understanding of the world but the state certainly considers you a unit of measurement <laughs> in its in yeah. its any of the world you have to separate yeah. sort of perceived legitimacy from actual or from which isn't upset from of, by these things from actual legitimacy uh, what were you saying alex um i guess one of the things i i want to point out is we should be concerned about protecting these kind of norms and these sorts of democratic institutions, I do have a worry that the liberal normies themselves are increasingly less interested in these things, like for the right reasons. Right. Um, and so I don't see a whole lot of, you know, we need to do this because overreach of the state is bad and it's very dangerous when a fascist takes over the presidency. 
what instead I'm seeing is decorum is really important and we have to be polite. Well, out of there, internet people, let's on, again. You know, I would say the wrong part of what was wrong with Trump and some of that, some of that stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm a little worried that instead of getting a push for more, you know, instead of getting a push for reining back in the excesses of the state, guarding against certain kinds of extremism, what we're getting is a push for decorum and politeness. And I don't like that because, I mean, we kind of hinted at this earlier, uh, Part of the reason some anarchists, myself included, don't like referring to what happened on the 6th as like terroristic or things like that is that it's right. not it's not the violence itself, which was the problem. Uh, it was who was doing it and why. Um, so, like, I don't have a problem with some people storming the Capitol building for good reasons. You know, like, I don't think it's it's that people are outside of the political norms or oh i do have a problem i do have a problem like, with people bringing zip ties and bombs to the capitol building with plans for additional harm beyond just right like, and that's what i'm clear, saying is like they stormed it with the intention of like kidnapping and harming congress people so that they could take power um, right which is different from like storming an ice detention facility so that you can free people who are detained there um but i i worry that like the yeah. biden democrats don't see the difference right they see those right, as right. the same thing right right and not i think to play devil's advocate but like what about those who like and i mean granted there, there were like legit fascists there there were a lot of people who just were pro-trump and stuff and 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 no matter what and we're going to want him to be in power um, but also, what about the people who were legitimately just duped into thinking there might have been some election fraud? Because the interesting thing that some people have discovered is that it wasn't just Trump supporters involved in that. I mean, yes, it was primarily. I mean, there was no Biden supporters, obviously. But like there were and you know, there were definitely right leaning like conspiracy theorists and shit who very much saw election fraud as a real possibility and wish like saw democracy under threat and like wish to see that as a thing. And I mean, that doesn't discount the entire other side of that that we talked about whatsoever. And yeah. not to say that this side of it is even a major part of it, but it still exists. And how do we engage with it? I mean, I, I think there's a lot interesting there, not just like, the hard question is the one Logan just asked about how the heck do we deal with the fact that half the country seems epistemically incompetent in ways that I don't think any of us would have ever anticipated that one could be epistemically incompetent and over the age of 12. Um, if that is that putting things charitably too charitable? I don't well, know. But, I mean, um, manipulated. And I, so I want to just note <laughs> I put out a piece about this uh, called Why Far-Right Cultism is a Dangerous Game, um, okay. mostly because I predicted incorrectly that this wouldn't happen on the 6th, and there wouldn't be right. some I sort recall of... Logan was the only one who got it right. <laughs> yeah, Logan got it right. I, I got it wrong. Um, but I, I wrote this piece... I got half credit. <laughs> I wrote this piece after it happened with the, the main point being... When you're dealing with people who are in a cult or a cult-like structure, who have different epistemological foundations than people in the real world it's it's a really difficult situation you can't negotiate the same way they're not they don't care about the same things anymore oh no right oh no alex got frozen um anyways no yeah. i mean one of the things that we have to remember is that People, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are. It doesn't matter anything like that. Like, Yeah, it's not intelligence it's, that's the problem here. It's yeah, un, no, at all. There's actually but, a type of intelligence involved in the level of mental gymnastics you have to do to think that these theories are right. 
Yeah, right. absolutely. I go. Okay, welcome back. Sorry, Alex, you froze up there for a second. Hey, I'm not sure where I cut off. Um, all of that was to right. say, there's the piece I put out, it's called Far Right Cultism is a Dangerous Game. I think it's important to acknowledge that there's cult-like dynamics going on here manipulation, brainwashing, whatever you want to yeah. call it. And so deprogramming these people or re-engaging with these people is going to take some amount of deprogramming. Um, yeah, and and I that's the hard question that I have no clue how to really begin doing that. Uh, there is another thing, though, in what Alex was saying earlier about uh, the extent to which a lot of liberal takes on this have been less than satisfactory. I mean, like, it's always been the case to me that liberal defenses of constitutional norms or whatever liberal in the prerogative sense not in the sense that someone like jason or i are liberal anarchists uh but centrist defenses of it have always been kind of wrong to me because they've always been based in the idea that if we don't have anything like this uh sort of common unified framework you know, everything's going to just fall apart and, you know, Hobbesian state of nature shit will take over. Um, interestingly, like, I think, you know, it's worth noting that Hobbes is reacting to a time very much like this, right? When he's writing Leviathan. Mm -hmm. But, um, but what's, what's, that's always struck me as wrong because the issue is that as long as we're going to, because like that just gets the empirical facts that polycentric orders are possible wrong. Um, and so like, to me, the reason it's important is just as a fiction to help rein in the worst, you know, the worst issues with the state. But as for the thing about civility and decorum, I'm not sure if that's the, the mis the thing that's wrong with it as much. Um, I, didn't, I didn't say civility. Um, I said decorum, specifically this, like, we should follow procedural rules because procedural rules because, because legitimacy. Well, I um, think procedural rules are a part of that, not because legitimacy, and that's the thing that I want to avoid, but just right. in the sense that's of... The part, that's the part I think is a problem with what they're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's based in this idea of legitimacy and upholding legitimacy. Right, right, right. But I don't think the issue should be with the idea of some proceduralism needing to be maintained. I mean, like, you can go obviously too far with it to the point that you're thinking, you know, cops can do whatever the hell they want because the procedural things of justice are to let cops get away with things or whatever. Um, or, but the idea that, like, specifically with uh, things like uh, the executive branch can't unilaterally pass a bunch of shit, um, even if that shit might be stuff that we like when, you know, the right person's in charge or whatever. That's the sort of proceduralism that I think gets underplayed, maybe not in anarchy circles, but in leftist circles broadly. Um, but yeah. Uh, uh, I'm kind of trying to grasp your point. Is, is your point, this is kind of a point I make to a lot of liberals is like, you know, they, they call upon Obama as being like, Oh, it was all these great things that Obama did. And regardless of what you think of Obama, whatever, the concentration of power beyond like normal procedure procedure um will be carried on into into the next presidency which will be somebody yeah, who works. yeah 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 there's definitely that point um like there's definitely that point there's also the point that um like i think a lot of leftists not just liberals would be extremely happy with the Biden administration doing certain executive order things on immigration, like reinstating the Dream Act or whatever. Um, that or Medicare for all. Yeah, or Medicare for all. Um, I was taking one that I would be more partial, more likely to endorse more than anything else. Um, and I mean, like a lot of the executive, we can. This is actually a really nice pivot over, I guess, to the other discussion we wanted to have. Um, like a lot of the executive orders that you would expect uh, the an administration to like this to do are substantively helping people in some ways, like you know, Dream Act type things. Um, 
but it's just unclear to me exactly what the right balance should be between stopping the state from abusing immigrants as much as possible and making sure that we have procedures in place that stop, you know, the state from spiraling out of control in the future. I mean, like, this is a hard thing yeah. in political theory generally, but I think it's an area where anarchists are t typically underthinking it. Well, and I actually, this is, I'm going to praise, I'm going to praise Joe Biden. Get ready. Um, <laughs> this is the only time you'll ever hear this. Uh, so Maybe I found out about this from the Intercept's Deconstructed podcast. They went through a whole thing on Biden's meeting with civil rights leaders and black leaders in America. And is, I mean, it's a fascinating breakdown for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the questions that comes up is he gets asked, why aren't you willing to do X, Y, and Z by executive order? Or are you willing to do it by executive order? And he says no. And he says the reason, he gives two reasons why he says no. The first is that he thinks it will, he thinks it will hurt him optically, you know, that Americans will be upset about it and aren't ready for that. And which is a bad that. reason. To be which fair. is a bad reason, right? It's too radical. We're not ready, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, That's yeah, a bad yeah. reason. But he also gives a good reason, which is when you do something by executive order or executive decree, the next president can undo it just as easily. Right, which is what half of what his executive orders are right now. <laughs> that That's my right. big problem with the whole matter of procedures. It's not even that I'm it, it, considering the system we live within, I'm not it's like especially opposed to government imposing certain things that would overall either reduce reduce net state power or just uh, raise equality and um, and and general check on the capitalist system. Right. Yeah, but the fact that you know it, we've concentrated power so much into the hands of just like basically one person or you know a, a cabal of people. Um, uh, that I actually don't like to use the word cabal because that I, that that has con that is Jewish connotations that I don't particularly like. So it's a conspiracy of people um, that can just undo it. And so, are we really building a proper infrastructure for a free society or a freer society? Is it if if yeah, after right. four years we can just elect somebody new who will just undo everything? Yeah, I think that's also a good reason. Um... I mean, yeah, so so let's, but like, you can see that a lot of people who would look at something like Biden refusing to instate the DREAM Act uh, via executive order, which I think he has actually for that one in particular. Um, but the exact example doesn't matter. Biden not, you know, instituting uh, student debt relief might be another one by executive order. A lot of radicals would just react to that with the thing, oh, this is an example of him uh, not actually hearing, just being like a shill for Wall Street and not actually hearing the the needs of people are not actually caring enough about, caring more about his reelection chances than, you know, racial justice or what have you. And like all those things are probably true. Probably true. But, um, but like if the reason is mostly not it's too radical or whatever, um, but it's going to get undone or it's a dangerous precedent to continue to allow president presidential power to spiral out in this way with Congress. It's, and by the way, it's not just that we've given the presidency this much power. It's also that Congress in the meantime what time has become so dysfunctional that it can't even get rid of a executive who just mm -hmm. physically assaulted it. Um, so like it, it's not entirely just you know coming from one dynamic but uh yeah i, I don't know I, I think that that's concerning but like i guess we've now pivoted over to some of the stuff that the Biden administration is doing away from uh violent uh away from the coup and the impeachment I yeah mean, do, do we have anything else to say about i don't think we do that? um but moving over unless you guys have any thoughts remaining I mean, other than to really watch out for a lot of the laws that are passed. Oh, yeah. No, we should just oh, yeah. comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. we should. Yeah. Um, oh, Q. I, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is, no matter our view of the coup, no matter, we have to be weary of 
all the things that have pretty much happened. Well, not all the things. Some of the things have been good. But, you know, like, a lot of things that have happened in the wake of the whatever we want to call what happened on the 6th. Um, I mean, we've seen... I mean, we've seen the expansion of the surveillance state. We've seen big tech flexing powers in ways that are concerning, even if we're, I mean, even people who are very much not anywhere close to Parler's demographic of, you know, alt-right folks and, you know, outright bigots, let's be real. Um, I mean, it's too far right for, right libertarians, for some right libertarians. Um, but I will they, say that if it's not too far right enough for you as a libertarian, you're just not a libertarian in any reasonable sense of the word. But, <laughs> <laughs> and that shouldn't be even remotely a hot or funny take, honestly. <laughs> no, I mean, I think Parler should definitely have the 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 freedom to operate and I think it's concerning the amount of power that Amazon has to take it offline but it's interesting like even people like Evan Breer who's very very much a hardcore leftist um, from Fight for the Future who's also a folk musician who coming on Tuesday for our cabaret I mean she talked about the fact that Amaz the power that Amazon has to take down Parler is the same power that various different platforms have to take down You know, you could take, take down, down Signal. 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 Oh, yeah. Take that oh, no. down that, from, that's from various like app stores. Wait, that's not. But I mean, the at the same time, you've seen stuff like. Uh, I mean, I think it is in, in in the terms of corporate power, but uh, uh, real quick, at the same time, you've seen, uh, you know, like BitTorrent. They released. I mean, they flat out laughed at. Parlor's problems, and so, you know we're basically been there, done that, and we're like, next time don't choose Amazon. Well, I mean, I, I do want to note that I, I think I disagree a little bit here uh, because I don't think that there is the same sort of corporate power that could take down Signal because Signal is fundamentally peer to peer. They're not relying on right. They're not relying well, on any big corporate server. Um, so there's that, but like, I get the bigger point here is, uh, the bigger point here is supposed to be about corporate power intervening in our ability to engage in an equal public discourse, but I'm not even particularly concerned. Well, I think that's a bigger problem generally, but I don't think this is an instance of it. Cause like, let's face it. What's almost certainly going to happen is within, uh, you know, the next year, some rich Republican boomer billionaire is going to come out with another with a bunch of funding for some code monkeys to put together a server uh, to just instigate another parlor. Like we already see a right wing alternative to Twitch that wasn't taken down. I forget what it's called. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it, all I know is the logo is like yellowish. Um, because a bunch of like right, alt right streamers were getting banned. Um, so like I, I just don't see that. Uh, that this is an instance of that problem, even though I do want to acknowledge that that's a real problem. Yeah, I actually really like, there's a piece up on the C4SS site right now from the Tech Freedom Collective. They've been doing monthly articles for us recently, which are really right. good in-depth looks at tech problems. And the one, the, pat, the last one they put up in January, I guess, um, is about Parler and this whole issue and like what should anarchists be concerned about what should we not be concerned about because i think it is a complicated one like on the one hand right. on the one hand fuck parlor like you made bad choices sucks to suck but on the other hand i i think it's worth acknowledging 
the somewhat public nature of online communication. Um, I am. Um, I think that a good way to sum it up, and I and I'm and I'm plagiarizing from a tweet that unfortunately I can't remember well enough to to properly cite, but. And I know that there is some conversation, uh, you know, obviously amongst broad, broadly amongst libertarians, but even in left libertarianism about, you know, deplatforming and things like that. But I don't think that, I think that the phrase, there are some people like Nazis and other kinds of fascists and white supremacists and stuff like that who need to be deplatformed. And then also major corporations having the power to do that is a bad thing are not contradictory statements. I think that's really the essence of, of the point. It's that it's, it's we need to have a, a, a more, a, you know, policy, a polycentric, diverse economy of, of these kinds of, um, you know, solutions. Because I, you know, I wasn't particularly upset by the fact that Trump in particular was um, as an individual was uh, kicked off um, yeah. to social media. I, I, but I thought it was really disturbing because it revealed very suddenly and very viscerally how powerful these, you know, centralized hierarchical corporations have become. I forget who said it. Um, I, I, uh, but it's, you know, if you can, if you can silence a king, you are a king. Uh. Well, it was interesting because, you know, I think that models like Mastodon, for instance, really offer a decentralized solution to this problem with being able to kick people off of individual Mastodon servers, you know, if, like, their behavior on the according to the people who control those particular servers is deemed, you know, d disrespectful or whatever, um, not adhering to their rules or standards, they can kick you off. But they can't kick you off a Mastodon as a whole. And so I think that that's a good balance of, like, you can be kicked off of any particular Mastodon server. So we started like a C4SS server on Mastodon. We can kick fascists out. We can kick out whoever we wanted. But they could go create their own like fascist server somewhere. And we wouldn't have the power to kick them off of is... their server. So it's not censoring, but it is not platforming at the same time. And I think that's about the best balance. And I'm not saying I support, like, you know, Nazi anything. You know, obviously. I think anybody who's that's read it. my writings listen, <laughs> but like, you know, at the same time, there is a dangerous precedent with any form of censorship when it's controlled by the state or corporations. Mm -hmm. I mean, and currently, yeah. that's who controls it. So I think that solutions like Mastodon, and I think seeing like projects like Collectiva, which is a Mastodon server, um, K O L Collect. E, sorry, I need to see this spelled out. I'll spell it out later in this. Oh. But Collectiva, um, you know, is the server that was started by It's Going Down and a bunch of other, like, anarchists, and they've been promoting it. And I really think those type of projects are really cool as far as alt tech projects. But as other folks like Ford Fisher, who spoke before us, who very much, you know, also promoted um, Odyssey and Library, we we will be promoting the or we will be uploading these videos to after the mm -hmm. show. 
at the same time, you still need to be on those mainstream platforms to catch people. So it's kind of a balancing act. And I think that we also pull that off well, too. We is in the center? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I still am not, don't see any reason to think this sets, in particular, a dangerous precedent with respect to tech. But there was another part of what Logan said earlier that I really do want to hold on on, which is that there's a very real danger that uh, the state will overreact to this and start... Um, did we lose... Yeah, Eric? apparently. Yeah. Oh, okay. no, nope, coming back. All right. Oh, uh... um, there is another part of this. That's the sort of thing we'd usually edit out, by the way. Um, there's another part of this that... Uh, the state can overreact in like 9-11-y ways to this sort of event and start cracking down on any perceived, uh, not just right wing, but any perceived non-standard political group um, for fear of terrorism or what have you. You know, there's civil liberties concerns with some of the things that Biden has at least put out the trial balloon on with respect to new anti-terrorism bills, as if it's not already there aren't already a lot of laws against uh, against storming the Capitol, or as if there aren't already like it. Is it new like uh, unnecessary, both like legally unnecessary and also dangerous precedent sorts of anti-terrorism stuff and new surveillance things? As if the FBI couldn't have just gone on a parlor and saw what literally everyone else in the well, universe as if, saw. As if they oh. didn't know this was coming, right? I mean, this is the point that this is the point that I find the most salient is like, why would you give a police force, right? Whether you're talking about, you know, Capitol Police, whether you're talking about the FBI, whatever, none of them did anything to stop this from happening. They had plenty of information that something like this was going to happen. In right. fact, you know, some anti-fascist activists were saying leading up to this, like, hey, this is going to happen. We found all their chat logs and like it is going to happen. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, my big problem with a lot of the. I mean, C4SS ourselves them. have been warning of this sort of thing just by monitoring sites like 8chan for right. the last right. five years or whatever. Yeah, and so to say that the to say that the you know yeah sorry right to to say that the FBI and the police and whatever should do more to stop this kind of terrorism is just ridiculous to me because like I don't, does anyone know the numbers on like police who were part of the crowd that stormed the Capitol? I was just about to bring that up. I don't know right. the exact numbers, but it was it was. I don't. I can't say a shocking proportion because any amount is is not shocking. Well, a shocking, yeah, no. a shocking if you're not, you know, in the know about what police actually are. No, yeah, exactly. yeah, no. Exactly. I mean, I talked to that dang dad recently for the Green Market Agorist podcast, which we will actually be premiering early yeah. um, at Coude Girl. But like, he was. He's a former police officer turned abolitionist and and anarchist, and he was not at all surprised at what he saw from that, from what he said. I mean, there have been FBI reports since, what, 2006? Warning, yeah, well, I mean, warning there's us about of... the damn leader of the Proud Boys as an FBI informant. Right, it's I like mean, they're all working together. Some of those that work forces have been the burn crosses. We've known right. this. And this is before and this is before we get to the results of the investigations as to the extent to which Capitol Police themselves were uh complicit and um which we won't speculate on here, because uh, that's a conversation for another day. Yeah. yeah. No, and I mean course, it's yeah. And of course the Proud Boys and other groups like that have a have a long standing history communicating with, with police uh officers and police uh departments to help organize around right. Um, yeah. avoiding brutality against themselves and ensuring in trying to corral anti-fascists and stuff. And right. then also mentioned that Biden's, uh, you know, anti-government extremist stuff does like, um, at least from what I read, specifically mention anti-fascists and Antifa uh, yeah. as like a major threat. To the Which by the way, like, even, even if there wasn't a major mainstream ideological bias against those sorts of movements, because, you know, America... <laughs> um, 
<laughs> even if there wasn't that sort of bias, they would still do it just in a sort of hollow effort to look like they were being even handed. Mm -hmm. uh, for the same reason that like Facebook banned a bunch of C4SS writers who were actually our most moderate liberal writers. Um, yeah. Uh, banned, a bunch of, banned, like, banned a bunch of C4SS writers. Um, but kept me and Gillis. On yeah, Facebook. yeah, yeah. Also kept <laughs> me. I mean, I haven't <laughs> used Facebook in forever. Right. Right? But, My profile still there. It did get banned. Even right. though I'm in several leftist gun groups, too. I used to use Facebook to set up in-person fistfights with fascists. So <laughs> I know, right? So, so there's... I know several other people who've done the same. So, so like, but they're going to do it just in an effort to look like they're being even-handed. Um, but anyway, uh, all right. So I think that's enough on that. Uh, we don't have much time, but let's move on to discuss. There have been some demands for actually, guys. if we want to be real. This is the last panel of the day. We got as much time as we want. Oh, but people aren't going to want to. Yeah, nobody out. wants to sit through us just blabbering on and on. <laughs> okay. uh, people will watch, and also it's going up on video after, so it's up to us. Fair okay. enough. Um, but uh, the other, the other thing we wanted to talk about were some of Biden's more economics-oriented uh, executive orders. Uh, I wish we had remembered to discuss the other stuff because we had a perfect segue into this. But, um, you know, I could never be a mall cop, so I can't write segues very well. Um, um, but, uh, minimum wage. Yeah, there's, so there's minimum wage stuff. So the only executive action that I know of that Biden has taken with respect to this is raising or ma mandating government... Uh, agencies to hire people to like have their hiring practices so that the minimum that they pay is $15 or something like that. Um, which I guess I don't really have any strong objections to at all in any way. Um, you know, sounds just like an employer deciding to pay their employees more. Yeah. I mean, who cares? It, uh, slash good. Ethan was here, he'd be very upset. <laughs> Goodman? Uh, yeah. He may, I've got very, uh, very mixed feelings on it, actually, both ways. And I know my article... Uh, on the uh, executive order itself? No, on minimum wage. Right, right. So there are also demands for Biden to do some sort of action, which I don't even think he would have the constitutional authority to do, really, um, which is why this would have been such a nice segue. Um for him to raise the federal minimum wage through some sort of executive action, or at least push Congress to do so. Um, right. Uh, and that is, I think, the more interesting discussion. So, Logan, what were you? Oh. Um, <laughs> if Logan's gone, can I speak my piece on the issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts um, on... Okay, so to clarify, when I say Nathan would be upset, I just think I just know that uh, Nathan, if, if I recall correctly, is much more of a traditional takes more traditional um, economist kind of approach to minimum wage. And right. I know that there are distinct issues with minimum wage as um, in if from a mar you know a market economics pr perspective. Um, although there are distinct examples of raising the minimum wage that doesn't that have not. Um, raise the cost of living but pr primarily at the end of the day i don't want wage labor at all really in the long run you know i want i want like a large-scale cooperative system like richard wolf talks about or the sort of movement towards like peer-to-peer -to -peer networks and um and neighborhood um workshops like kevin carson talks about but you know obviously that's in the long run and for now what i think that the minimum wage does or the struggle for the minimum wage does and uh and I'm also borrowing from Logan here um, in our earlier conversation is that a it's it's been a it's been a union and a minimum wage, you know, and so expanding unionism. And I don't mean to spe steal your thunder, Logan, because this is a hundred. No, you're good. Hundred percent. Your point is that like unionizing as broadly as possible across the economy is so important. And if that comes along with the minimum wage, that's awesome. And then I also think that the that the struggle for the minimum wage is a great moment of the working class flexing its muscles, like demonstrating mm. that they have 
a, a level of control, which is a very syndicalist kind of take. I, I don't know. I'm, I don't think that either of those negate, I mean, like, okay, first of all, you can have a union without, ha you can have stronger union rights without having bad price controls. Um, that is true. That is true. I like, I don't get why those are treated as if they are a package together in the fight for 15 movement so much because they shouldn't be. Um, and in fact, I think the emphasis in fight for 15 sometimes gets so focused on the minimum wage that it loses its good emphasis on increased labor activism. Another good point that I will steal from Logan. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it should be, you know, and a union first, not or union first, not 15 first. Well, the point um, I made in the recording we lost is that if you get a strong union, you don't need a minimum wage. Yeah. Then you well, can yeah. Because <laughs> then you can just exactly. negotiate well better, right? So the one thing that I've been struggling with, and I mean, I think most people, I mean, I think most of y'all have restated a lot of my argument within... <laughs> You know, my good. article and, that, you know, that. the podcast that we didn't record properly um, because, no, sorry, we tried, we did everything properly. The bot fucked up. The bot. Um, mm -hmm. Don't trust AI, y'all. Uh, or at least not Craig bot. <laughs> yes. Right. Anyways. Yeah, we're, so... we're transhumanists. Don't trust tech. Yeah. <laughs> Right? God, what was I saying? I'm sorry. Uh, minimum wage. Minimum wage point. So, I one of the things that I've been struggling with is minimum wage job loss versus minimum wage increase in income, therefore increase in spending, increase in demand of products and services, and increase in Wait, let me let me for flex labor. My, let me flex my economist, my classical economist Ooh. takes since I'm wearing oh, my, you're gonna... my Michigan econ shirt. <laughs> because like, look, the issue is not, none of those things are really net gains from the minimum wage. Because Thank what you. happens is it creates a deadweight loss. Um, it's not just that people are losing jobs. It's also that um, uh, people are not able to accumulate human capital because there is less earning going on or hours are reduced. In fact, unemployment is, I think, the smallest issue. Not the smallest, but not the biggest issue with minimum wage. It's uh, small firms not able to pay it, getting driven out of the market at the expense of large firms which we saw happen in Seattle after they were raised their minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, underskilled laborers not able to accumulate human capital because they are getting less hours or not getting hired as much. Um, so their long-term prospects at higher income are lower. And it's the just sheer amount of deadweight loss created by the minimum wage that makes it nearly like any gains you might have from people having more income as a result of the minimum wage are offset by the fact that it's also costing the producers more and that those deadweight losses just don't help out in the long run. So like, I don't think there's any good macroeconomic argument for the minimum wage. I don't think there's really any good ar economic argument period for it other than maybe that it might lead to some employers to invest more into people who they otherwise wouldn't pay more. I think, uh, what's her name at, uh, at, was it Christina Romer had a study to this effect um, that yes. that it would increase uh, UCLA that it would increase like investment that firms make into their um, uh, low skilled laborers to drive up their human capital loan. I think like that's the right. only good economic rationale that might be there for it, but it's not obvious to me that that offsets the very well known and very well accepted cost to it. And this is why like I also don't really buy the it's the uh, the working class flexing their muscles because you don't want the working class to flex their muscles in a way that actually harms them and everyone else at the same time. You want the working class to flex its muscles in intelligent and good ways that are good for them and everyone else. Yeah. Um, well, I so, mean, the things, sorry, continue your point. No, 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 no. I rant over. <laughs> I mean, the things that aren't talked about are the fact that certain unions, in certain areas where minimum wage laws have been passed, have 
petition for exemptions to the minimum wage right. to allow them more competitive advantage in order to keep their jobs. And it's, a, I mean, it's a weird thing. I mean, people don't talk about the fact that the and it harms wage, migrant workers. Yeah, the minimum wage as much anyway. In the first I mean, place. to be fair, migrant workers aren't held to the minimum wage anyway. Yeah, I mean, fair let's enough. be real. But um, one of the things that's interesting is the minimum wage in this country was implemented on racist means. Right. It was implemented. By okay, so black workers were willing to work for le for much less than white workers at the time period because of how racist this damn country was. And we're talking like late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, Largely, and I early mean, progressive era. It's not a good thing at all, but it's one of those things of. Would you rather work and make some money or would you rather not work and make no money? They were able to at least make some money until the white unions came along mm -hmm. and decided that since they were getting priced out of jobs because black folks would work cheaper, they were going to set union standards at higher than that, at what white people wanted. And so, all of a sudden, if unions were able to pressure businesses into accepting their contract through whatever means they, you know, they they chose to, you know, out of collective uh, uh, organizing, it they ended up pricing black workers out of jobs yeah. right That's in a that. way that ended up hurting that workforce in a major way right, right. And, i mean it's it sucks to view them as a workforce in general but it's like we're living under capitalism That's right and, that and so it like sucks that they're getting paid way less than a livable wage but when the when you realize the choices between a job or no job, or a job or a job with like decent hours, or a job with cut hours, or things like that, like it kind of makes sense, right? Like I can understand both sides of the argument, and that's why I'm very torn. But at the end of the day, I think that unions are the answer. And I mean, I know I just talk, I, I know I just talk shit about unions like they are with You're my shit about a particular racist union. Like, like are a terrible. Shop, white unions. Like, yeah, I mean, unions in general, especially grassroots unions like the industrial workers of the world which very much operates on a more democratic grassroots level and a, a similar to anarcho-syndicalism, anarcho-syndicalist style unions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that those type of unions are very, very important. More important than minimum wage could ever be, but I also do think that as a transition, universal basic income is not a bad idea. And I think it kind of side skirts the whole question yeah. about minimum wage, welfare, etc. And if that's too radical for you, at least expanding their income tax credit in the meantime. Like, right. yeah. Like there are other policy solutions to increase wages and address uh, address labor issues other than price controls that backfire radically. Yeah, uh, I also I wanna... wanna. Eric, what were you saying? Sorry. Oh no, I just also want to add that, like, I, you know, we're coming at this from a very like this is the system we live under. You know, this is market economics. Like, some people have to work for less and stuff like that. But I also want to like make clear an acknowledgement that like 
this is not a natural state of the world or inevitable by any means. Right. This, this is a specific situation of the allocation of the means of production and stuff. I'm not the not to be the like resident Marxian, but like like that that you know this uh-huh. this a lot of libertarians will be like, oh, you know, minimum wage hurts people. That's it. That's the le- that's the end of the conversation. And whereas I think we as left libertarians need to take that step forward and be like. You know, there are upsides and downsides in minimum wage, but at the end of the day, it's about restructuring the entire system so that, um, you know, re- I, there's... I mean, I, I think that's right, but I just don't think that the minimum wage is, itself should play a part of that restructuring at all, myself. Well, what do you think about Kevin Carson's idea of a basic income and a minimum wage as a way to disrupt corporate power in combination? Uh, no, the minimum wage itself would backfire in all the ways that it would with or without a minim- a basic income. The basic income is good enough by itself. And I do very much... Uh, see, the thing that I'm cautious about is the ways that it increases corporate power as opposed to the power... Right. As opposed to small, yeah, business. It's small business. Exactly. And exactly. I mean, fuck small I mean, businesses to too be in fair, some ways... To be because fair, let's be real, as an IWW member, as someone who's been involved with the labor movement for more than a decade, small business owners and bosses within that can be just as exploitive, if not more exploitive, right. than some big businesses. Right. But at the same time... Big businesses holding mon- more of a monopoly causes a problem. And so giving more power to small businesses at least decentralizes that in a way that is useful towards decentralizing the market more generally. And I think that, I don't know. So that's why I tend to lean towards the minimum wage is not a good idea. I mean, to be fair to Kevin's argument, if you put a transfer payment that was universal above the binding price floor of a minimum wage, it would probably mitigate its bad effects because like, if you had to choose between working a minimum wage job, like your opportunity cost of working at that point is just, you know, too low. Um, but I do want to point out that that will have implications for stopping workers from accumulating human capital and being able to compete on the labor market in the more distant future. Anyways, Alex, you had a, it looked like you were sitting on something. I've been waiting since this conversation started because sorry. I, I read, so sorry. well, no, I just read this Atlantic article, the counterintuitive workings of the minimum wage, and I hated it. And I want to talk about that. Um, All right. But I'll actually jump off what Eric was saying about like, yeah, we need to do, we need to think broader than just like within capitalism, is this a good idea or not? Um, And my major problem I had with this Atlantic article, and I think this is true of arguments on both sides of this debate, is the assumption that like the way we're doing things right now, having one job that is your job for which you work a set wage makes any sense at all. Um, and this is this is a, a conversation I've had with social anarchist friends before who have asked me, like, would you defend people like having a wage in like, your future anarchist system? And like, yeah, if someone wants to like work for a wage, that's fine with me. But I I don't think in an actual anarchist society, the vast majority of people would have to or choose to do that. Um, and this is this is part of the the concern I have with both sides of the argument. So this Atlantic piece, counterintuitive workings of the minimum wage, essentially makes three arguments. Um, The first is that $15 is not enough to have a significant impact on employment, which might be true. Yeah, which is Um, probably true. But again, employment, but again, employment isn't the major issue. But once again, employment is not a measurement of anything that matters. And that means, like, if that's true, it means 15 is not enough to meet the current standard of living. Like, the argument I think the pro minimum wage people make that is correct is like, yes, wages have divorced from increase in productivity, right? Like, right. workers produce more than they get paid for increasingly. Right. Um, that's bad. And there are a lot of interesting reasons why that is. Probably doesn't have to do with the price floor. I don't think it has anything to do. Right. And so that's that. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's it's starting from all of these flawed assumptions about what matters in the economy, what levers you pull to do what. And so this whole article is going back and forth talking about like, you know, how much employment increases or decreases and how much the cost, you know, of a hamburger, right, increases or decreases, which like with like each dollar that you add. And it's just like if you take a step back from that, you're trying to tweak the system to solve a problem that could be solved by just changing the whole system. And then it gets to the end of the article and she says, and even if there were adverse effects for like people in parts of the country that have a different cost of living than average or, you know, really low skilled workers, workers who just entered the economy like young teenagers, you know, even if there are bad effects for those people, her solution is, well, the government should just like create more policies to address those problems too. And okay, like, so so you're going to create so like this is like the not to sound like a boring right libertarian, but this is exactly the sort of thing that Mises was going after in dynamics of intervention, right? Um like it's okay, so we're going to create to we're going to have a bad policy that has all these bad and negative effects. And instead of having better policies that can address the same thing without these bad negative effects, we're going to try to fix those with all these other policies. Like yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's that's it, enraging. It's then accum it's like turtles all the way down. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so then, what? Are, instead of just doing a universal basic income, like, right? Duh. A universal basic income and expanding union rights, like make it easier for people to negotiate for higher wages, and institute transfer payments if that suits your fancy. Instead of, uh, yeah. And, and, and I have like, I have similar overwhelming frustrations with the debate around rent control. But that's another topic for another day. But, another yeah. topic entirely. But the, and the, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a price control, so they're very yeah, close to it's, it's yeah. largely the same argument. It's largely I mean, the same, yeah, the same The stuff, other thing but. this Atlantic piece did, um, uh, so they she makes the argument that, like, okay, yes, it will increase the cost of products produced by companies that now have to pay a higher wage, but it's not going to be like your hamburger costs a dollar more. It's going to be like your hamburger costs 20 cents more. And, like, as someone who studied economics, that infuriated me because, yeah, every hamburger you buy is going to be 20 cents more, along with everything else if you've applied the wage floor to the whole economy. So, like, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand. I feel so out of my depth here as, like, an economic. Yeah, economic because it's like, a, just... left, it's like a, left shift, a leftward shift in the aggregate supply curve. Yeah, okay. So, price level goes, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, what were you saying, Eric? I feel so out of my depth here because I'm an I'm an economic anthropologist. I'm not an economist. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an economist. I'm like a philosopher who has an econ degree. But like, you don't need, I think, to have a PhD in econ to understand, you know, this sort of. Yeah. Well, right. To understand that that twenty cents on five things is the same as a dollar on one thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. No. And I and I wouldn't be a very good market anarchist if I didn't have a grasp on economics. Right. Right. Um, I think that's the thing that makes us the good anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, strong. I think, so that was spicy. I think our diversity in general is what makes us the good anarchists. Well, no, there we've had all sides of the minimum wage debate within this, aside from the hardcore supporters. But I mean, even I, being the skeptic. Like, sure, I'm the only one of my out of my roommates who probably voted against the minimum wage law, but also I'm not entirely like upset that it passed anyway because I, mean, I do see ways to organize around that regardless. I'm kind of with Logan on this one. Yeah. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, this is largely just a proxy debate for broader frustrations I have about the way that people approach economic issues in general outside of the context of this particular policy. Uh, like, like I said, like a lot of my frustrations here also translate over to my frustrations with the rent control debate, which also transfer over to my frustrations about like, uh, price gouging, quote unquote, in medical stuff, right? Same sort of stuff where people want to say price controls the solution while ignoring the actual cause of the problem and blah, blah, blah. Um, 
So, like, I think that's the main reason why this this really, like, gets me enraged. But I have to admit, like, if the minimum wage raised to, raised to $15, it probably wouldn't have that big of a macroeconomic effect because the number of industries or the number of uh, employers who are actually affected by it, it's not that binding across the entire economy. Um, well, and, and, and productivity right. has increased more than that. Like, right. Yeah. Any study that was been... a living wage 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It and just really enrages me. Been... Because it's a any sort of, study that's sorry. been done on the subject has been in as far as whether as far as job loss versus like uh, uh like living wage increase um has been inconclusive at best as far as within the United States and we have to be real about that. I mean, not any. Study. I mean, we talk about well, recent studies. It, it's Let's more be than real. Recent studies. But Let's what be I'm, real. What I'm saying is the reason for no, there that. No, were, there were recent studies in Seattle that were quite conclusive in the negative. Were direction. there? Okay. So, I'm not, it, depends. Maybe I'm... it depends what percentage of the average wage the minimum wage is set at. Because if you set the minimum wage at 100% of the average wage, it will definitely have macroeconomic effects. If you set it at 50%, it probably won't. Um, we also got it. Gotta... is like 70 some percent. So. Yeah, we also got to think that the fact that who it's going to affect, no matter how all of a portion of the population affects, is going to be the most marginalized. Right. I mean, right. honestly, I, even as a white person, I mean, as a trans person, just trying to get a job, I mean... Granted, I gave I gave up after a while, but I haven't held a white market job in years. Well, because like all aside the aside from like C four SS and writing and reporting, you know, like that's about it. Like everything else has been just like whatever gigs I can find. It's been all freelancing, honestly. And I think that's a very important point because all the even though like it sounds like when we say you know it affects the formation of human capital. That sounds like a very intractable way of putting that. But like what that means is people who have historically not been able to get as much experience working or what have you because of things like discrimination or things like personal stuff in their lives that make it harder to work as a marginal person, marginalized person are the ones who are going to be most affected by this. So yeah, like I think that's a very important point. But anyway. at the same time, one of the things I want to point out is, like, while it does hurt some small businesses, it does not hurt co-ops. Go co-ops. And that's, Go co right. and that's the reason why, like, despite the fact that it hurts small businesses, I do still kind of sometimes lean toward some of the anarchist arguments that minimum wage might be a good idea in the meantime because it doesn't hurt co-ops, it only hurts hierarchical small businesses. I think right. but but like I think I mean there's... I've worked plenty of co-ops where I've worked for like a dollar and some change an hour. I think there's an important an important issue here that no that it's not like the minimum wage is going to make a bunch of people switch over to co-ops, right? Yeah. Because, like, there are other reasons why co-ops are not common in our economy. And, like, those policies should be targeted long before you mm -hmm. try the seventh dimensional chess move of harming workers with a minimum wage, right? I think Logan actually touches upon that in um, her article, Bullshit Jobs and the End of Work as We Know. Right, the yeah. Whole, the, the regulatory infrastructure in place that keeps co-ops from coming together. But I also think co-ops are, you know, co-ops in an idealized, you know, Richard Wolf sense, like, do kind of circumvent the whole issue, not just because minimum wage doesn't affect them that much, but because you have an entire different dynamic of labor. It's not a wage labor in the sense of, like, an employer and employee. And so you don't have that constant dynamic of, like, decreasing wages while trying to increase productivity that Marx talks about all the time. Right, yeah. All right. Uh, I think that covers that issue. Are there any remaining thoughts? No. no? All right. Well, I, well, I think just okay. I just I love the the 
harmony. I love the harmony between the more economically correct and the more compassionate solution in all of these cases being just give people things. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. That is, that is uh, fitting, I think. Yeah. All right, well, I think that we can uh, tap it off there. So um, plug some stuff. What do we want to plug? <laughs> um, um, free uh, incarcerated anarchist Sean Swain. Free him. Uh, oh, right. yeah. That's what I'm, that's what I'm putting out here. Um, um, he's in immediate blackout right now, and there's been a ton of conspiracies against him, including a plot to murder him by um, some prison guards and stuff. So, like, you know, write, do your, go to the C4SS site, go to his article, and write a letter, um, you know, encouraging clemency and stuff like that. Right. That's my plug. Um, there's also, as always, all the work we do at the center, C4SS.org, and Patreon com slash c 4 sdotorg um where you can find this sort of conversation we usually try to have one once a month when craig plays along on discord um but uh or we might work, switch right? to something else to yeah i think i work. think we will because <laughs> that was enraging um uh, and also you can check out eric does a lot of work on Raj's. um Logan has Green Market Agorist, um, and Alex has all sorts of work all over the center, and this uh, all sorts of writing all over the center, and uh, this show that we are doing on Patreon for patrons once a month. Zach, who is your next guest for Mutual Exchange Radio? Uh, I am having Sika Dalmia. I just scheduled that yesterday or today. I I just scheduled it for next for week after next. Um, Sheikha Dalmia is coming on, and we are going to discuss the sort of influence of populism on the libertarian movement uh, and immigration policy, uh, which are the sort of two things that um, she knows a lot about. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll add that the uh, the, the next um, guest for the Orange will be Rai Ling on um, their piece, uh, Scarcity and Abundance Under Anarchism. Awesome. Cool. It's one of my favorite studies we've ever published. It's really good. <laughs> it's got good. graphs and everything. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for watching and listening or however you are consuming this. Um, and have a wonderful day slash month slash year. Solidarity. Solidarity, yeah. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night, y'all.